Uh, we appreciate it. Uh, I have a couple of questions for you before we begin. <clears throat> First, your firm was asked not to view the interviews that preceded you. Can you confirm to the best of your knowledge your firm did not view those interviews? We did not, we did not. Very good, thank you very much. Uh, we have 35 minutes allotted for each interview. The timer will initially be set for 10 minutes and you'll provide your introduction. Once 10 minutes has elapsed, or when you complete your introduction, if sooner, the timer will be reset for 25 minutes, by which time we'll ask the interview questions. All firms will be asked the same questions, but may I be asked follow-up questions based upon your responses. Uh, before we begin, uh, let me know if you've provided uh, PowerPoint materials. It looks like you have, so our staff's got it up and ready to go. With that, 10 minutes is yours, ready to begin. All right, great. Well, first of all, thank you folks for uh, the opportunity to bid on the work again. Um, you know, we certainly have enjoyed the opportunity to help you out uh, historically, and uh, we hope to continue. Um, you know, it's an honor to work with your organization. What I wanna do right now, if we could move to the next slide, is just uh, introduce the team. It's been a pretty consistent team, uh, but I know there's some new members of uh, the committee, but uh, uh, we'll just go uh, down one by one. I'm Eric Gonzaga. I am uh, the na National Managing Principal over Human Capital Services practice, in addition to our uh, you know, executive compensation and compensation consulting practice in general. Uh, I've been doing this type of work for, uh, you know, in excess of 20 years. And my specialty is specifically working with uh, government, for-profit, private, uh, tax-exempt organizations, all focused in on uh, the financial services and asset management function. Uh, consistently do the work across industries, and to, including government sector. I've been a lead engagement partner with, uh, uh, you know, four CalPERS over the last five years. Eric? Thanks, and hi, everybody. Uh, Eric Meshka, uh, Senior Manager in our uh, West Region Leader for the Human Capital Services Practice. Uh, been in the compensation consulting and, and industry uh, for about 15 years, um, you know, managing compensation programs, implementing programs uh, for organizations like yours. I've uh, been part of the team, uh, the CalPERS team, for, for five years, and uh, really my specialties around, you know, compensation plan design, as well as, you know, risk management and, and assessing risk and pay plans. And you have uh, Rob Storick here. I am a manager in our human capital services as well. Um, I've been helping out with the uh, the CalPERS engagement for the last two years. Um, most of my clients and my specialties revolve around public sector engagements uh, as well as financial services. So um, I've certainly enjoyed um, helping out with, with CalPERS thus far. And um, yeah, looking forward to a, a rich conversation today. So next slide, please, and Eric, why don't you take this one? Yeah, uh, so what I wanted to do here briefly is just uh, kind of outline additional services of Grant Thornton or the different areas of Grant Thornton and how they may you know, support our work that we do for you and who's kind of behind the scenes as well. So reflected on the, the team today is our compensation benefits consulting practice. And that's primarily a lot of your discussion about and, you know, how we'll uh, propose to support you, um, you know, moving forward. But also behind the scenes, and we do, have, Grant Thorne does have a very large public sector advisory group. Um, and so we work with them pretty closely to understand you know, what's going on from a federal, state, local perspective, um, government, as well as, as we're developing compensation programs, um, get an understanding as well of uh, the local market, um, just from a politics perspective sometimes, and just get some understanding and uh, ways to message our, our programs a little, a little bit more efficiently. Um, in addition, we've got an internal controls group that I personally work with pretty closely, and they're, uh, controls, our controls advisory group you know, gets involved in SOX testing as well as other uh, controls testing to, to mitigate risk. And so we'll work with them as we're developing programs uh, to ensure that the implementation of them is as smooth as possible. And then last, we do have an actuarial services group who we've pulled in previously and will continue to rely upon as you know, we're doing benchmarking or comparing your pay programs to the market. And you know, I know you know a large portion of it is a you know, defined benefit plan, and looking at that pension for you know original members as well as new members and those benefits and how they relate to the market. So we'll, we'll use those services as well. Um, but all in all, I'm just you know in a quick summary is that you know Grant Thornton's a very large organization. I mean, we've got a lot of teams that we rely on and pull in and you know ask questions um, just to make our services for our clients you know, even that better. Eric. 
Next slide, please. So our role as a compensation consultant is, uh, you know, truly to be the board advisor. And, uh, you know, just as, as a segue to the work that we've done, the work that we'd like to uh, 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 perform uh, going forward, is that we're a dedicated board advisor. Um, you know, the team you have assembled, you know, we're in board meetings day in, day out, and, our, and the board is specifically our client. Uh, we view uh, our work within the lens of advising the board and their fiduciary duty, balancing, uh, you know, the need to recruit, retain, and motivate. The underpinning of all our work is really that what we are looking at is focusing on the long-term sustainability of the compensation program. Now, what that means is essentially we want to make sure that uh, whatever pay programs we're advising you on, we're always thinking about, okay, What's the mission of the organization? You have a 100-year mission. And our focus is going to be not necessarily looking just at market practices, but thinking about what's the best fit for the organization in terms of uh, structuring uh, the, 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 the investment office, the executive compensation pay program. And is it the type of pay program that specifically complements the mission and achievement of your mission uh, as an organization? Uh, you know, in addition, uh, we will share with you all the institutional knowledge around market best practices. Uh, you know, Graham Thornton, we certainly are considered a market leader in terms of working with government organizations, working with financial services organizations, asset managers. We have that full plethora of, uh, you know, market practices with which to educate uh, our board, our, our boards that we advise in addition to uh, you know, gleaning, uh, you know, different, different strategic situations that may say, you know what, let's do something a little bit different than market practice and let's think about best fit. And finally, uh, you know, what we will do, we know that, uh, you know, working with CalPERS can be demanding at times because you have a lot of pressure on you as an organization and you have a big mission to fulfill. And, uh, you know, what we promise you is that uh, we will be responsive uh, as we have been, uh, you know, as you need us, because we know things come up, uh, you know, you are, are one of our priority clients and uh, the responsiveness uh, with which we will meet your needs will be second to none. So next slide, please. Now, what have we done, uh, you know, to help you out, uh, you know, historically? And I, I, what I, we like to think is that uh, when we advise our organizations, we're not talking about, um, you know, coming up with any novel, uh, you know, compensation. What we're looking at is helping to advise you uh, to, be, to, to make incremental changes to reflect your strategies as they uh, react over time. You know, in 2016, when we first started working with you, we established the framework with which decisions should be made. We talked about salaries, annual incentives, and long-term incentives, and even deferred compensation. 2017, uh, we implemented the concept of uh, shared organizational metrics across both the investment office and the executive team to view, uh, to come into view in terms of making sure that the incentive metrics going into 2018, uh, we're talking about one CalPERS, getting the leadership team all on one page, incentivizing, incentivized by the same uh, principles uh, with shared outcomes. Moving on to 2019, we helped you update your salary and incentive ranges and implemented uh, a long-term incentive plan, uh, which helps to, uh, in, in, in our thought being that you have, uh, you know, after 2019, you have a wonderful, well-rounded compensation program. There's always room to do, uh, to, to, to do more, but we do believe that it balances the right, uh, you know, considerations in terms of mission in terms of appropriate performance metrics, in terms of paying uh, enough, but not paying too much, uh, you know, satisfying the alignment between pay and mission. And finally, uh, you know, going into 2020, uh, you know, we, we, we helped you, we assisted you in terms of revising the annual incentive plan metrics because they always need updating. So next slide, please, uh, you know, just to conclude our presentation. When we think about uh, the work that's been done in collaboration with your organization, we think that, uh, you know, what are the considerations now? Well, we think one, 
What do you do in terms of uh, compensation planning, in terms of times of economic uncertainty? Certainly, certainly that's what we're seeing right now. And we look forward to discussions in terms of how should this, um, these uncertain times result in tweaks, not necessarily wholesale changes, because we think you have a very good compensation program in place. Secondarily, focusing in on further alignment of the compensation plans between the investment office and the general leadership team. Balancing risk and reward, uh, we put a heavy emphasis on risk management when it comes to the programs we help put in place. And we think that's gonna be more important going forward considering the volatility of the marketplace in addition to the need to recruit, retain uh, the right types of uh, executives. We think a lot of work has been done in that arena but we always have to take a look at how the market's reacting and take that fundamental core and reacting appropriately. And finally, focusing on diversity, equity, and inclusion. Uh, you know, uh, certainly uh, CalPERS is a leading organization, uh, serves a lot of uh, community needs, not just the whole concept of making insuring pensions for the state of California, but in addition to being a corporate steward, in terms of making sure that uh, uh, you know, the firms that you invest in are acting appropriately. And therefore, uh, you know, we think there's a need to always have your lens towards diversity, equity, and inclusion. And there's ways to, to, to uh, uh, look into that as part of your compensation program. So with that, uh, you know, that concludes our opening remarks. Thank you very much. So we'll move on to our question period. We'll reset the clock for 25 minutes. First question is, based on your response to section seven of attachment F, proposal questionnaire in the RFP, your firm indicated that you would negotiate the CalPERS standard contract terms and conditions. Please note that in no way is this an acceptance by CalPERS of any requested deviations from the terms and conditions. Can you please confirm your response for us? Confirmed, confirmed. Very good, thank you. Question number two goes to Ms. Ortega. Thank you. Uh, based on your knowledge of CalPERS, the Board of Administration and its Performance Compensation and Talent Management Committee and our incentive compensation program, what actions would your firm take within the first 120 days if selected? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, first and foremost, we would want to conduct uh, in, in some interviews in terms of, uh, you know, because it's been five years since, uh, uh, you know, we, we were engaged, but what we want to do is engage uh, and, and get perspectives from the committee specifically, because it has changed over time in terms of perspectives and wants uh, in terms of improvement to the overall compensation program. So that's issue number one. We would want to survey the landscape uh, with the compensation committee and, and the, P, P, the performance talent and compensation committee specifically. Secondarily, uh, you know, we, we, we think it's always good to, as part of that, engage in discussions around contemporary trends of what's going on relative to asset managers, relative to other pension funds in terms of <coughs> the environment <coughs> and what's going on from a compensation perspective specifically because in this day and era, there have been some emerging trends and we'd wanna collaborate and, and discuss those trends with the organization. And then third, we just wanna establish priorities for the organization. And we talked about what the priorities are. I mean, I certainly think that it's good to, uh, you know, benchmark pay with some frequency. The secondary aspect is we would want to engage on, on, on dialogue in terms of how can the pay programs be aligned better uh, from an investment office, uh, you know, from a staff perspective, in addition to, uh, uh, you know, the administrative executive side of the house, how can we make sure that uh, the compensation plans are fully aligned to ensure that that element of one cal CalPERS in this difficult environment, the pay programs continue to emphasize uh, the direction of the organization. And fourth, uh, you know, taking care of after the interviews, uh, thinking through what the hot items are for the organization, we would want to address those in terms of making sure at that first ultimate compensation committee meeting where uh, we're establishing an agenda for the next year, uh, how do we sequentially uh, you know, lay that out in terms of issues to address and explore to continue to refine CalPERS compensation program? 
And you know what we would say is that uh, although we've been working with you for five years, compensation programs are always evol evolving. So we'd want to take a fresh look in terms of surveying uh, you know, the, the various engaging with the compensation committee to do a couple things again, education to uh, understand uh, you know the pressures and uh, the issues that you think worthy of investigating. And through that, we will identify uh, you know the path to pursue going forward. Uh, I would think that this will continue to be a cadence in that uh, there's always issues to address from a compensation standpoint, but we want to blend it with always educating you in terms of what the hot button items are from a compensation perspective. And there are several, given this economic uh, environment and the, the, the dynamic environment. Uh, so we'd want to lay the groundwork such that we can uh, you know, pursue a very sequential approach to addressing compensation throughout the year. Thank you. Question three is Ms. Middleton. All right, thank you. What current compensation issues exist for public sector employers as related to incentive pay and highly compensated executive and investment management positions? And how might those issues impact CalPERS ability to attract, hire, and retain high quality executive and investment management team members? Uh, absolutely, and I think the first uh, you know, the, the first uh, issue confronted by government sector and public pension related organizations is just the night, the need for talent, and it's a different talent uh, than you're looking for for the traditional uh, you know government uh, type positions because you're looking for folks that have to be have the ability in terms of. Uh, uh, engaging in asset management, managing a very large portfolio. It's one of the largest uh, in the world. And so you, there, there needs to, uh, organizations struggle with the balance with, okay, this is a public service job versus this is where we need to get the talent. Our thought has always been, you don't need to manage uh, to uh, compensation programs that will pay consistent with uh, for-profit industry. It's just not feasible. The, the resources aren't there from a government perspective. But it, it's about coming up with a balance between government sector pay along with for-profit pay. Ultimately, the issue will come down to what it, find, making sure that you have that right balance. We think that you're close to having that right balance. Uh, uh, but uh, the additional point is also that there's always ways to tweak the program to make sure that you're aligning uh, you know, with the mission of the organization versus what uh, typically would occur within the context of asset management. We think you have a good fundamental pay program uh, that can attract your fair share of talent uh, as a general rule of thumb. Uh, there may be some exceptions on occasion, and it really comes down to uh, where are the demands for talent. We don't see you paying competitively with uh, the asset management industry. We see you uh, taking a blended approach and, uh, and it certainly is one that uh, will always have an eyesore relative to uh, you know, the, uh, the external scrutiny that you get as an organization. But we're, we're convinced that the pay levels and the target pay levels that we're talking about are reasonable and uh, within a certain degree appropriate to uh, recruit, retain your fair share of talent. That is going to be the primary struggle is balancing the need to recruit talent and what those pay levels are with finding the right person to find that commitment to the service that you're looking for. And finally, uh, you know, making sure that uh, when you think about the optics, that there is something very reasonable uh, to defend the pay program that you have to uh, the world at large because you're under significant scrutiny, so. Thank you. The uh, next question is uh, Ms. Olivares. Thank you. The scope of services for this contract includes the provision of compensation-related educational sessions or workshops. If asked to provide this service one or more times during the course of the contract, what approach would you take to design a session? And what key topics would be important to share with us during such a session? Yeah, and, 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 and Ms. Olivares, I appreciate that question because I do think it's fundamental uh, you know, to your organization to provide continuing education. It, it, compensation is a very tricky subject, and it is also one that uh, can often be misunderstood. 
our approach uh, would be very similar to what we spoke, to how we addressed Ms. Ortega's question. And it would be that, um, you know, we have our ideas around what to educate you on, and it certainly would be public sector pay and how it compares to public sector pay within the context of pensions and within the context of pensions, how the domestic organizations compare to what goes on in some of these sovereign funds up in Canada, et cetera. Uh, so just uh, uh, a, a, we would educate you on best practices in that arena, along with uh, what goes on in uh, you know the for-profit in addition to the foundation uh, or, or endowment sector as well. Uh, because all three of those industries, and I guess four if we, can, if we consider the international pension fund related organizations and sovereign funds, uh, have different pay practices. And I think because of the uniqueness of CalPERS and its size and its importance to the economy as a whole, uh, that we would want to educate and, 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 and make sure that there's a, a fundamental understanding. And we would endorse doing it a couple times a year. Uh, in addition to talking about the respective governance components. But before we got there, what we would do is survey the uh, the committee just to make sure that uh, it doesn't matter what the issue is. And I know that everybody on the committee has a different background. We wanna make sure that uh, when you're exercising your required governance and your highly publicized governance, that uh, you have the education you need to exercise these decisions. Uh, we're not scared of difficult conversations. We will always give you our, 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 our best advice that we think makes most, the most sense, both from a retention perspective, in addition to balancing that with, you are a government organization, and we need folks that are committed to mission, and the pay program needs to be constructed in a certain way to reflect that. But we will also make sure that we are taking into account uh, the levels of understanding at the committee level, just to make sure that we are doing our best so that you can exercise your fiduciary obligation. And whether that's, uh, you know, I would expect it's a couple education sessions, in, you know, in the first year or the second year, as you have new members, uh, we would endorse, as we do with some of our other clients, having one-off training sessions with committee members if they want some individual training, but it will be reflected to a balance between our understanding of what we think folks need to know to exercise discretion uh, in fiduciary obligation, in addition to making sure that our educational training is uh, uh, is what it needs to be, given the different backgrounds of the folks on the committee. And just to add on one point there, um, so beyond established trainings, you know, whether at the beginning of our engagement or once a year or once a year, um, you know, especially during times of economic downturn like we're seeing now. And that's when we most often see changes in, in widespread compensation levels or incentive designs or the need to be uh, particularly responsive. So, you know, we certainly have experience with formal structured trainings, but, you know, we also can provide anything ad hoc, whether it's 15, 30 minutes, just updating on trends we're seeing, or if it needs to be, you know, down the road, more uh, in-person type training. So, you know, our, our work with the board would be tailored to the expectations of what you guys need in the, uh, uh, the given moment. Yeah, and I would just follow up with that and say that um, our practice is always to make sure that, uh, you know, when we put our recommendations in front of uh, the committee, they're fully vetted out. And we actually really enjoy, uh, you know, the dialogue. I think the committee does a wonderful job of uh, you know, testing our, uh, our theory, our recommendations. But uh, as part of that, we always wanna make sure that uh, as part of any of our recommendations, we are, because it's all public, we will give you, uh, you know, full disclosure for the rationale behind our recommendations. And it's always going to be couched in, why does this fit CalPERS and its mission? Thank you. The next question is Ms. Middleton. All right, thank you. Uh, please describe your experience working with diverse boards or similar bodies which operate in public settings. What do you do to balance the needs of the board, the organization, its members, and beneficiaries when you develop and present recommendations? Thank you, Ms. Middleton. And I think the first answer will be, uh, and, and, and so I'm gonna go to the end in terms of uh, um, you know, what our targeted outcome is. 
when we work with uh, CalPERS, the end game in mind is how can we come up with the best pay plan that aligns with the mission, which is to provide pension benefits uh, to your members. And so all of our uh, all of our recommendations, all of our constructs, it's balanced around two things. Can we get the right talent? And if we're going to pay uh, investment office or executives reasonable amounts, let's make sure that it is aligned with the expectations and what is going to be beneficial to the membership. So part of that is talent recruitment, but if you can get the talent in the door, our pay programs, 100% of our emphasis is going to be how can we align with that 100 year mission, which is to say, how can we ensure that we're paying benefits and meeting the obligations of the pension? Now, uh, in terms of getting there, um, you know, we work with uh, a number of diverse boards with di that represent different constituencies and certainly some in uh, California as, we, uh, as well. And we know that uh, government organizations have different constituents. Uh, they represent different constituents. We're going to know and we're going to ask continually, as long as we're engaged, uh, the right questions to ensure that uh, whether it's part of an educational session or whether it is part of engagement with the committee, making sure we understand the different perspectives, both good and bad, in terms of uh, the reactions to uh, you know, pay levels at CalPERS and pay constructs. Uh, we want to know uh, what the members' worries are in terms of pay and how it impacts uh, you know, benefits to, uh, to the pension holders. And what I will say is that uh, whether it was the last five years or going forward, uh, we're doing our best. We can, we'll always push ourselves to do more to make sure that we understand, uh, you know, the, the, the perspectives of the different constituents, different uh, pension committee members to make sure that, again, 100% of our focus is on how do we align a with the mission of the organization. And you're talking to a lot of firms, and what I'll tell you is that uh, there's a lot of great firms out there uh, that can uh, you know pull numbers give you what the right numbers are and we can do the same where we say we stand out is simply that where our emphasis our value proposition is that we will engage with you the right people the right process in a systematic manner to ensure buy-in so folks know that we're listening to them and secondarily that 100% of our pay programs are going to make to be based on alignment with the mission of the organization. And we'll follow diligent processes accordingly. Yeah. And that last piece is important. You know, you're never gonna make everybody, all the constituents happy, your constituents or the, the members as well. And so it's always having that you know, consistent foundation, you know, the methodology and the approach and the philosophy that you have that you're making decisions on. And as long as you're consistent and you've got something to rely upon, the outside noise, if you will, um, that people will speak to or, or comment on, um, you know, that you know we're making the right decision for the organization and institution is based upon the philosophy methodology that we have. Right. Thank you. The next question, Ms. Olivares. Describe your experience developing incentive plan recommendations, which include qualitative and quantitative performance objectives as well as shared organizational quantitative performance objectives. What key elements must be considered to create meaningful, measurable objectives? And I think that uh, I'll start out on the quantitative piece. Um, you know, the general rule of thumb historically has been that um, you have to establish outcomes. And in our approach to helping an organization establish outcomes is to think about the balanced scorecard. Uh, you're an organization that has a lot of demands, uh, you know, on your organization, and uh, and so we think about membership, we think about stakeholder satisfaction, we think about investment returns, and we think about engagement with uh, your employees as well. All of those are, are incentive worthy, and what we need to ensure the appropriate targets. I mean, this is not just about uh, you know increasing. Uh, you know, the value of the fund, although that's very important. Uh, there's a mission and there's a service aspect to, to your delivery. Our perspective is that there should be shared organizational outcomes and we assist and facilitate. We have to make sure we test the methodologies, make sure there's an adequate sample size and history 
uh, to ensure reliability, we agree that outcomes are very important. And we think shared organizational outcomes are important for senior leadership specifically. Uh, there's always, there can be a carve out for individual performance that tends to be a situation where there may be some different responsibilities for folks that have individual initiatives with which to pursue. But uh, uh, by and large, if you're a senior leader, the majority of your pay should be driven by shared organizational metrics. Now going to the secondary aspect, which is the qualitative piece, uh, no more uh, than before, uh, no, more, uh, no more than this present moment has there been an acceptance of uh, qualitative metrics. And uh, whether that's discretion or whether that is alignment is an individual truly reflective of the mission of the organization. Uh, we've been, uh, you know, on, 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 on the front end of this where we have encouraged, uh, you know, discretion and qualitative metrics coming into play recognizing that every organization wants to sustain their mission for the long term. So thinking through qualitative uh, uh, perspectives in terms of, uh, hey, is this individual, does it, do, do, or her, uh, this individual, does he or she align with the mission and values of the organization? Uh, additionally, from a qualitative perspective, when we think about uh, taking a look at something like investment returns, if investment returns, uh, you know, come back wholeheartedly, and uh, due to no, uh, you know, activity of uh, you know management itself, it's just to come back in the market, recommending that the uh, uh, the board or the committee exercise discretion in terms of let's make sure we right size this award to the positive or to the negative, based on relative performance. And so, uh, you know, on that qualitative side, what we like to do is identify. Uh, you know, the general performance categories with which that subjectivity, that qualitative aspect is going to be exercised. And so outcomes are important. That's the foundation for any sort of compensation program. On the other hand, uh, using qualitative modifiers or quali qualitative uh, uh, assessments of performance are fair game, and they should be because it forces some wonderful conversation at the committee level to think through uh, you know, should discretion be exercised? Should we take into account a more holistic perspective around compensation? Uh, just to make sure that the committee is communicating what they want to via that qualitative assessment. Very good, thank you. Question seven, Ms. Ortega. As the board's independent consultant, how do you ensure independence yet maintain a collaborative working relationship with CalPERS management and or team members? Well, um, you know, I think the first approach is that uh, uh, we do think it's necessary to engage with management to do fact finding. Um, you know, finding whether it's investigating performance metrics, taking a look at historical performance, because that's where oftentimes uh, uh, the knowledge is and making sure that we understand if there's a new position, uh, you know, what is that, uh, uh, what, what's that position's job content or taking a look at emerging strategies as you go through strategic planning processes, making sure we understand in granular, granular detail what those, uh, uh, what, what the strategy is going to be going forward, what are the tweaks to the existing strategy. So we do believe it's important to engage with management. However, we are engaged by the committee and we will, we will always ask, uh, you know, for permission to engage with management. Uh, we will work directly with the chair, the vice chair, whoever it is to make sure that we get delegated authority to, uh, you know, to communicate with management and to the extent that there's an outcome of that, open transparency in terms of the activities we performed in addition to the knowledge that we uncovered. So to us, it's more a matter of transparency. We work for the board. We work for the committee, no question about it. However, uh, you know, just in terms of fact finding and making sure we have the, the appropriate knowledge, uh, you know, just like we do with other organizations, we're going to need to engage with management, but we will give specific, we will get specific authority from the committee, from the chair, and we will also make sure that uh, there's full transparency in what the conversations were about. Thank you, that concludes our questions. Are there any follow-up questions from any of the subcommittee members? Uh, Ms. Olivares. 
Thank you. Um, earlier, you mentioned diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, as you're probably aware, there are significant discrepancies in pay equity based on gender, race, ethnicity, and sexual orientation. How do you consider those factors? Well, I mean, what we'd want to do, and, and, and I also thought that this would be, uh, you know, a nice step, uh, you know, going into the new relationship. I mean, I think that, uh, you know, when you think about pay equity, there's a couple things going on. I mean, one is that we, we have to take a look at uh, pay equity for comparable job classifications. So mm -hmm. there's a challenge there, just making sure that we're taking a look at, uh, you know, comparable jobs. And that, but then ultimately, it's what's the relationship, if we have the right benchmark, relative, uh, you know, to those, um, uh, you know, various, uh, uh, those various uh, constituencies. Uh, and so... It's important to uh, undergo a pay equity study, uh, you know, every three to five years, and, and, and we'd enjoy engaging in that just to make sure what is the pay relationship for comparable jobs relative to market. Um, you know, we've we, and, and we certainly have come across, uh, you know, these pay equity issues, and I think going back 20 years, uh, you know, again, as your firm, we think strategically, and we're also willing to have tough conversations. Every time we've found a pay equity issue, we've raised it. And, uh, you know, with, with uh, our various constituencies, our various clients, and uh, our thought being in this instance, given the scrutiny that you all are under and, uh, and giving, given your diverse uh, employee base, uh, we, uh, one of our recommendations would be to undergo as a prominent government organization that uh, has a lot of prominence throughout the world would be to uh, you know pursue a pay equity study, and it really comes down to making sure we're making an apples to apples comparison in terms of job content. In addition, studying the relationship to market, in addition to some of the performance criteria and experience factors that go into where an individual is uh, positioned relative to market. And and just one one item I would add on is not only is it important to study um, any diversity equity and inclusion issues that already exist within an organization, but it can also be important just to look at where CalPERS is uh, hiring from, where they're recruiting externally from, looking at the employment sources to see um, not only what happens when people are in the door, but how people are getting into the organization. So it's certainly, it, it's a robust topic that's never been more important, and um, we would approach it from uh, every, every possible angle to, to study uh, where any issues might be. I'd also like to know if and how you tie r increased risk or risk exposure in general to compensation and performance. For example, on the investment side, oftentimes there's a bonus structure related to investment returns, but the concern with that is that risk is increased. Right. So how do you take that into consideration? A, tough, a couple different ways. One is to make sure that the risk management policies are followed because uh, you do have um, you know, certain risk protocols and, 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 and uh, a certain risk appetite within each one of your asset classes, et cetera. Uh, you know, if, if, if those are violated, there's no bonus. If they're not consistent with, uh, you know, the risk protocols, the risk principles that you have in place. Secondarily, uh, you know, there's certain, uh, you know, design mechanics, uh, you know, that you can follow. Uh, you know, one is, uh, when we take a look, I mean, it's making sure that we're establishing reasonable goals given, uh, you know, the targeted returns that you have as an organization. And there's a couple different things you can do there. You can reduce the slope in terms of how much, uh, you know, as soon as you get above a certain rate of return, is it bonus worthy? It may not be an absolute linear pull. It helps to decrease uh, decrease the risk. Um, Secondarily, it, it, you know, they're, 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 it, it's appropriate. It, it shouldn't be all or nothing where if you get to a certain, uh, you know, targeted return, that's the only element at which you would pay out returns. And then third, if you have a cap in place that manages the relative relationship between uh, risk and reward, uh, you know, that's appropriate. And finally, making sure you measure performance over the long term, uh, which we've assisted with the organization uh, over time, just to make sure that the the, the uh, annual bonus plan ref reflects long-term considerations. It reflects um, uh, an appropriate uh, degree of opportunity. On the other hand, uh, we don't want it to get in the way of uh, impact.
impacting loan returns because we know that sometimes, uh, you know, it, it, it can be, uh, you, you, you get great returns for a two month period. Next thing you know, everything goes downhill. And so what we're looking at is making sure that there's always balance from a short term and long term perspective. And we think the organization has made good progress in that arena, certainly working with uh, uh, your investment advisors as well. So long winded way of saying, Ms. Oliveris, that uh, there's some complexity to it. On the other hand, uh, it, it's making sure that the structures are there that don't over reward high returns for taking excessive risk. Very good, thank you. We've uh, lost, uh, exhausted our time. So we appreciate you being here with us today. Appreciate your presentation, so thank you. And with that, we are gonna take a, uh, 10 minute break to be ready for the next group. So we'll reconvene at 1140. Thank you all for being here.